Welcome to Springwater. It's uh, nice to see you again, <laughs> um, even if it's online. Uh, thank you for all the encouraging words that came uh, after last week's video. It was a bit raw and vulnerable um, for us, but we're glad that it was a blessing for many of you. This uh, morning's video, which will um, I'll read a passage from Palm Sunday because it is Palm Sunday. Uh, today we'll have some uh, worship. Uh, there will be prayer. We'll give you some updates of what's going on. And also Lindsay will share with us some of the things that are on her heart. Um, and we hope you um, enjoy this uh, video. Data of where we're at with things like the food bank but I just first wanted to remember remind you of these the palm crosses that we always have many churches have on this day um, sorry I can't give you give you one through the camera but if you would like one please let us know and I'm sure we can get we can either mail one to you or drop it by I'm sure we can do something so this digital um, thing is catching because this week Candice has put together this amazing very good. kids clip, YouTube clip, which she's sending out to the families today. It's it's brilliant. It's shown a side of Candice we didn't know was there. So, you know, she may be, well, no, I'm just kidding because that will, that will scare her. But it's very, very good. She's done an amazing job um, and I think the kids will love it. So that's, that's really exciting. It's amazing how we can adapt to this digital thing, obviously. For the time being. I'm going to read from um, John 12, 12, uh, triumphal entry of Jesus into um, Jerusalem, and then we'll move into a time of worship, which Stuart and Lou have prepared for us. And we appreciate that, Stuart and Lou, very mm -hmm. much. Um, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Verse 12. The next day, the large crowds that had come to the Passover festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Praise God. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, just as the scriptures says. Do not be afraid, city of Zion. Here comes your king riding on a young donkey. His disciples didn't understand this at the time, but when Jesus had been raised to glory, they remembered that scripture, that it said that about him, and that they had done this for him. The people who had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, had reported what had happened. That was why the crowd met him, because they heard that he had performed this miracle. The Pharisees said to one another, You see, we are not succeeding at all. Look, the whole world is following him. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship, during the festival, they went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two went and told Jesus. Jesus answered, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth, a grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life 
in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that the servant will be with me where I am. And my Father will honour anyone who serves me. Let's pray. Father God, we give you this morning, we give you the uh, words that are spoken. We ask you to come into each of our minds and our hearts and speak to us by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. As we worship, as we listen to what you say, we pray for each other. You, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, would enable us to be like a grain of wheat, Father, to reach out to those around us, that many grains would come, so people would taste and see how good you are. Guide and lead us today. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name.
Thank you, Stuart and Lou. That was uh, really great. We hear one of their songs before the um, before Lindsay uh, speaks to us. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we bring this world to you in the fractured and disconnected way that it can seem at times, Father, and people all over the world being very fearful um, about what is occurring. But Lord, we know that we can rest in your arms and you are king of kings and lord of lords and you will care for us so we bring this world to you in the myriad of different places father from the, those places that are peaceful those places that are war-torn those places that have much and those places father that don't know where the next meal come from father would your presence your people be a living re a reincarnation of jesus in those places Father, I pray you'd be with this government, with Boris Johnson, you'd bring um, your shalom to him, to Sir Keir Starmer, the new leader of the Labour Party, Father, and all the other leaders of the different parties, Father. You'd give them a heart for the poor and the marginalised and bring your love and grace to flow into all the different places. And I pray for integrity and truth, Father God. Lord, I lift to you all those people who follow you in the UK who are seeking to live out the way of Jesus in a myriad of different places, whether it's with lots of people or with just one. Would you be uh, with them, Father, um, in this time of coronavirus, Father? Uh, you'd be with those who are on the front lines in hospitals, Father God, in, in stores, in caring for people with food banks in various places. Father God, have mercy, I pray. Have your hand against this disease, this coronavirus, getting any more uh, worse within our country, Father. And Lord, for us in Springwater Church, may you have your hand of blessing upon us, guide and lead us, enable us to be those catalytic kingdom influences in the place where you have us. I ask you to bring to mind now those people you know who you know need a touch of God in their lives, whether it's for healing, for protection, for shalom, to spend some time praying for them. Whether it's children, families, spend some time now praying for them. Father, you know there are many people on our hearts, families, friends, who need special touch, your touch, your grace, your healing your love in their lives. Be with them, I pray. Be with them. Father, but we know that we are not alone in this area. There are other churches and uh, that we connect with and work with, Father. Other believers that are in this area, Father, I pray that we would be able to live out a witness where there would be, it would impact the, the villages around. So I pray, Father, for this morning for uh, St. Michael's just down the road, Catholic Church, Lord God, that you have your hand on their whole congregation, which is spread out over a wide area. You'd be with um, Deacon Brian and Father Michael. And Father, the reality of Jesus would flow out from them and through them. Thank you that we all have a good relationship. Thank you that we're trying to work together. And in a myriad of different ways, Father, live out the reality of Christ. So be with them. May you bless them, Father, more than they could ask or imagine. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your touch into those in our community that need healing. May they this week 
truly taste the fullness of the kingdom where you would bring shalom, peace, healing, and restoration in your lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
So, so um, and now, Lindsay's going to share with us some of the things that are on her heart, especially for focusing on Easter. So, uh, let me pray. Father, be with Lindsay. Let your Holy Spirit guide and lead her, and may our hearts be receptive to what you are going to say to us today. We praise you and we give you glory. In Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. This feels very strange, speaking into a microphone with computer at the side with a, with a PowerPoint, but it's great that we can do this, and um, I hope that you all enjoy it. So last year, um, I spoke on Palm Sunday as well, and I felt then that I wasn't supposed to speak much on Palm Sunday, but was actually going to look at the Stations of the Cross, which we've always had up in the garden the last few years. This year, uh, as I was preparing for today, I felt the same thing. So apologies to all of you who were there last Palm Sunday. Some of this may be repeated. Some of it definitely isn't. But I really strongly felt this is what God wanted me to, wanted me to speak about. So without further ado, we'll look at the Stations of the Cross. We're not denying that it's Palm Sunday. And we remember, as Kevin has already said, that this is when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. But we're going to focus, about, focus on his journey to the cross. Some of you might be thinking, what are stations of the cross? What on, what on earth does that mean? How does, what's a station got to do with the cross? Basically, this is a practice that was developed many, many years ago, whereby in a church or in a, a meditative area, a garden or whatever, you would set up little areas um, where you would put symbols and scriptures relating to specific events in the journey that Jesus made in Jerusalem to the cross. And so that is what we're doing today. We're going on the journey with Jesus, ending up at the cross on Good Friday. Traditionally, as you can imagine, you do this on, in Holy Week, and of course that's what starts this week. So let's start You can pick where you want to start your stations. I've actually decided I'm going to start with Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. It, it happens just after he's come into Jerusalem on the, jon on the donkey. It's mentioned in Luke and in Matthew. I'm going to start reading in Matthew 23 first. Let me read it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your people together, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want that. Luke's version goes further to describe the anguish that Jesus felt. In Luke 19, as Jesus came to the city and observed, observed it, he wept over it. I'll carry on reading, it's not on the screen. He said, if only you knew on this of all days the things that lead to peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. Now you can't see it. The time will come when your enemies will build fortifications around you, encircle you and attack you from all sides. They will crush you completely, you and the people within you. They won't leave one stone on top of another within you because you didn't recognize the time of your gracious visit from God. And that is what happened. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed in about AD 70, I think it was. Why am I starting the Stations of the Cross at this point, you may be wondering. For me, because both of these passages show the depth and the enormity of the love that Jesus had for his people and the tragedy that he knew was unfolding for them because they wouldn't believe, because they couldn't see who he was. Just hear that in that first one. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you, how often I've wanted to gather your people together, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want it. Kevin and I have been struck so much by these passages over the past few weeks. Last week, he talked about the fear of God and highlighted the importance of the love of God. As I listened to his sermon, I was struck by how much, how close we feel to God or how close we feel he is to us is related to whether we see him as a distant and judgmental God of whom we are scared, worldly fear, 
or whether we see him as a loving and intimate God who would do anything to bring us closer to him and to whom we want to fall down on our knees and worship. Godly fear. These passages, the first in our Stations of the Cross this year, show the depth of God's love seen in the way Jesus speaks and responds, how he's longing for Jerusalem to recognize what is going on. In Luke, we see him weeping. In Matthew, we hear the longing in his voice. This is heartbreaking for Jesus. He wants everyone to know who he is and what he is about to do for humanity, how the horizon is going to change beyond recognition. As I was pondering this, I began to think of our situation today, how the coronavirus is shifting everyone's landscapes to think of things that are most important to them. How much are we praying that their eyes will turn to Jesus? So that's our first station. Let's move on to the next one. The first one has put everything in the right context. This is all about love, God's love for the world. Our next station is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as you might remember from last year, this is a powerful one for me and a beautiful picture thanks to Rosemary. Last year, I shared how important it was for us to spend some time in the garden with Jesus, to share in his pain and his grief. Reading from Matthew 26, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over, go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me even one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I think he was spirit speaking about himself then. His spirit was willing, but his flesh was feeling pretty weak just then. Just look at those phrases. I'm deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here, stay awake with me. Can we feel the emotion in those words? The need for his friends to be with him. Those of you that are in lockdown on your own know what it's like to not be able to have your loved ones around you in such a difficult time. Jesus needed his friends to be with him. He needed company of people who loved him during this tough time. How does it make you feel to realize that Jesus felt that same need? If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Hmm. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to get out of it. This is bigger than we think. Jesus, who is God, didn't want to go through with everything he had to go through, if at all possible. Of course, he ends with, not my will, but yours. The Passion Translation says it beautifully. My father, if there is any way you can deliver me from this suffering, please take it from me. Yet what I want is not important, for I only desire to fulfill your plan for me. Moving on to the next station, which is still in the Garden of Gethsemane, because now events are, beginning, are going to begin to unfold, and Jesus knows that everything that he has been dreading is going to happen. We're in Mark's Gospel this time. The betrayal and the arrest. Mark 14. I'm going to read it. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. 
Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him. That much is clear in the upper room when they were sharing a meal together. But I wonder what it was like for him as he watched his friend, supposed friend, coming towards him with a crowd of people behind him, intent on taking him captive. What must have been going through his mind? That same grief that he displayed over Jerusalem? Knowing that while Judas was playing part a part in the whole sequence of events, he was acting out of the wrong motives. I'm sure he was looking on him thinking, Judas, Judas, don't do this, Judas. You don't need to do this. I think there is such a tri- tragic irony in the story of Judas. The religious leaders knew who Jesus was. They didn't need him pointing out. God's plan needed Jesus Jesus to be arrested, yes. So it would have happened. Judas' tragic part was one that was not needed. He could have been one of the followers of Jesus, watching God do amazing things as the early church grew. How utterly, utterly tragic. But his heart was wrong. Moving on to the next station. We're looking now at Jesus on trial. Matthew 26. So Jesus was taken to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and elders had gathered. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him and led him away to Pilate the governor. Mark 15. Pilate, wishing to please the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. I find this such a chilling passage. It's hard enough that Jesus has gone through the trial and has been condemned to death. But this year, looking at it, it was actually the mocking that hit me. Picture that scene. We can so easily glide over it without realising how yucky it was. It seems like the soldiers intended to mock him because they took him into the courtyard and they gathered the whole cohort to watch. And apparently this was very common. They would just humiliate prisoners, criminals that were sentenced to death. A purple robe, the colour of kings. Where on earth did they get that from? The crown of thorns. Most of us know that this was not little thorns that we would know of like on a rose bush, but massive, long, sharp thorns that would have penetrated his scalp. But it was also probably not placed on his head like a crown because, in fact, they would have put it on like the wreath that a Roman emperor would wear because they were really mocking him. And they would have pushed it down like the wreath would be pushed down on on the Roman emperor's head. Hail, king of the Jews. (laughs) Ha, ha, look at you, some king. And then they beat him with a reed. That's almost as if they were beating him with his own pretend scepter. Humiliation, utter humiliation, pain, pain beyond what most of us would ever experience. Pain from the beatings, the flogging, the thorns, and incredible irony. And all through it, Jesus just takes it. He could have stopped them, but he allowed them to humiliate him. You can imagine that same deep sadness that he must have been feeling. Oh, you have no idea what you're saying. In fact, it's the truth, but you can't see it. You just think it's a joke. Longing for them to see who he really is, even those brutal soldiers. He's nailed to the cross, and they crucified him, dividing his clothes among them and casting lots to decide what each should take. 
It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him, and with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. I'll leave a little space here just to look at this picture. Nothing more needs to be said about this part of the passage, I don't think. It's not easy to look at this picture. It shouldn't be easy. But as he's hanging there, what's happening below? Our next station is going to be looking at mocking. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha ha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the elders were mocking him among themselves. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. You're so full of words, but you can't act. See, that's what happens to a supposed king who rides on a donkey. Who do you think you are? There's a beautiful hymn written by Stuart Townend with a line in it that always strikes me. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. What a humbling thought. Do I mock Jesus when I don't see what he has done for me? Do I mock him when I don't see what he has done for everyone, the person I can't stand, the cynical neighbour? Do I mock him when I can't see that all of what he went through was in order that I might live, that I might face tomorrow, that I might thrive during this current crisis? Do I mock him when I can't see that all of this is as much about the rest of the world as it is about me, about the salvation and restoration of the whole world, redeemed to the beautiful relationship we see in the Garden of Eden of humanity and God and the earth, all working together in harmony. That beautiful relationship between humanity and God and the earth, all working together in harmony. Do I mock him when I can't see that? That's what all this is about, the cross. Restoring us to that beautiful relationship that we see in the Garden of Eden. And then we have the thief on the cross. Luke 23, one of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we have been condemned justly for we're getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Some light, I feel, in, a, in so far a very dark story. We know the end, but they didn't. And here is Jesus, betrayed, mocked, in agony, unjustly accused, still loving the world, still opening up his heart to anyone who sees him for who he is. A simple response, you see me, I see you, and yes, you'll be with me in paradise today. You see me, and I see you, and yes, you'll be with me in paradise today. Now let's look at, probably for me, the most profound part of the story. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm not an actress. I can't get the anguish into my voice that must have been going through Jesus as he said that. Mark 15, when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This part of the story, as I said, is for me the most moving and the most profound. And I never cease to be moved by it, every year, by the depth of what is going on here. 
Sorry for those of you who've heard me say this before, but it begs being said again and again until we take it right inside our hearts and understand what Jesus did. That dread that he was feeling in the Garden of Gethsemane, it wasn't to do with the pain or the humiliation. Yes, that was bad enough, but I don't think it was to do with that. I think the thing that Jesus was dreading the most was that he knew what had to happen as he died. He knew that God was going to have to forsake him because in order to take back the power of the enemy, to take back the keys, to conquer death, Jesus had to go into death to come out the other side. In order for God to put the world back on the trajectory that it was intended to be on when it was created, God had to abandon God. Jesus told his disciples, I and the Father are one. In order for God to bring the world back to the way he created it, God was going to have to abandon God. Can we get our heads around that? No, it's impossible. But it happened. God is one, three in one. And he, God had to abandon Jesus to his fate in order to bring him out the other side. What must that have cost Jesus, that dread of being separated from his absolute life source, from part of who he was? What must have that cost God? That is what he was dreading in the Garden of Gethsemane. And God would have been dreading that too. As one of my favorite theologians says, God was bereft of God for our sake. And Jesus gives up his spirit. Luke 23, our last station. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. The ultimate act of trust and submission. I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but as I said that, he breathed his last. I honestly felt tears and felt like my voice was breaking. The ultimate act of trust and submission. I'm actually going to draw this to a close now. As we're entering into Holy Week, these are thoughts to carry through with us as we come to Good Friday. And then, of course, beyond. In a few minutes, a song will play for you to listen to. The words will be there so that you can see what the song is saying. It was written in the 80s, so some of the language might be a bit out of date, but bear with it. It's a beautiful, powerful song. And then after that, I'll pray for us. But I just want to ask, can you hear Jesus' love for you in his voice and in his act? Can you hear his voice? Can you hear his clarion call across time? Can you hear the emotion in his voice, weeping over Jerusalem, heartbreaking for Judas, for the soldiers, for the people that put him up there? Can you hear his voice? This year, it seems a little louder. Come to me, I'm longing for you. All around you, things are crumbling. Systems that you put your trust in, none of that is stable. Take your eyes off the rubble and look at me. Look to me. I didn't give up my life just to fulfill some prophecies. I did it for you, for your family, for your neighbor, for everyone. For the woman, woman in Mumbai who has to walk 800 kilometers to go back to her village, to her community, her family. For the courageous nurses and doctors and supermarket workers and others who are sacrificing their time. And for some, even their lives, for everyone for the volunteers in the village who are going shopping time and time again for all the ones who can't. Come to me. I love you. On 
unashamed and naked in a garden that has never seen the rain. Rulers of a kingdom full of joy, never marred by any pain. The morning all around them seems to celebrate the life they've just begun. In the majesty of innocence, the king and queen come walking in the sun. But the master of deception now begins with his dissection of the word. And with all his craft and subtlety, the serpent twists the simple truth they've heard. While hanging in the balance is a world that has been placed at their command. And all their unborn children die as both of them bow down to Satan's hand. Then just before the evening, in the cool of the day, they hear the voice of God as he is walking. But they can't abide his presence now, so they try to hide away. But still they hear the sound as he is calling. Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam. Adam, where are you? In the stifling heat of summer now, the gardener and his wife are in the field. And it seems that thorns and thistles are the only crops their struggles ever yield. He eats his meals in sorrow till he sinks into the dust whence he came. But all down through the ages he can hear his maker calling out his name. Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? And though the curse has long been broken, Adam's sons are still the prisoners of their fears. Rushing helter-skelter to destruction with their fingers in their ears. While the Father's voice is calling with an urgency I've never heard before. Won't you come in from the darkness now for it's time to finally close the door Adam Adam Where are you? Adam Adam Where are you? Adam Adam I love you Father, I thank you for the hope that the end of this story brings. But Father, this week as we focus on the cross, as we, as we approach Good Friday, help us to be able to engage with some of the pain that Jesus went through as we ourselves are struggling in our own situations, 
through the, through the current crisis. Lord, we just pray you'd help us keep our eyes on you and on the cross, knowing that you are bringing victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Calm 